There was a time in Ontario when governments dreamt big and built big. But in today's economic climate, is this version of what's possible in our public spaces part of a bygone era? Joining us now for more on the state of the public and its spaces, Peter McLeod, principal at Mass LBP, a Toronto-based public engagement firm. Salima Raji, co-chair of Civic Action's Emerging Leaders Network and senior development manager at Build Toronto. Dave Meslin, founder of Toronto Public Space Committee. And Amy Lavender-Harris, the author of Imagining Toronto. And it's great to have you four people around this table today for what I think is going to be a terrific conversation. And just to get you in the mood to ruminate, look at the monitors over your shoulders here. And look at this footage from 1971 with a cameo from the premier of the day. Roll tape, please. It is a stimulating and permanent symbol of the work and achievement of the people of Ontario. The vision and scope of Ontario Place, ladies and gentlemen, gives promise of our vast potential. That is the gorgeous brand spanking new Ontario Place, which as we all know today is in big trouble, in need of a massive facelift, um, some rethinking, et cetera, et cetera. I know none of you around this table was even alive when that footage was taken. William Davis, of course, 41 years old, is the premier of the day. But Amy, when you see that, what do you think when you see that footage? Well, I think it's very cute. The, the Ontario area type song, the promise, the openness, the inclusiveness. But my, my first thought is Ontario Place isn't really about Ontario, at least as I've ever experienced it. It's more about Toronto. Yeah, but it was about Ontario. The Ontario taxpayer paid for it, and anybody from around Ontario, Ontario could the go Ontario, there. In Toronto, the Ontario taxpayer pays for everything here. That's not <laughs> new. <laughs> okay. Dave, what do you think when you look at that footage? I think there's a sense for a lot of people in my generation that we can only dream of that type of excitement, that we collectively as the public are going to invest our own money and build something for us, by us, for us. And that might be partially a misunderstanding because I think we also don't celebrate the things we are building enough, but I think to some degree it's true. There's something, there's something lacking that doesn't allow in our current political or economic culture to allow for that to happen. I've never we... seen anything like that except on a retro video. <laughs> and I think that's a shame because I'm almost really? 40. Really? You've, you, you have not experienced that kind of like, massive communal project type thing for public space in your life? You don't think that's happened once? I can't think of something right now. Something that was public. No. Huh. Okay. To be continued. Salima, when you see that picture, what do you think? Um, I don't identify with it. I moved to Toronto 10 years ago and I called Toronto home and Ontario home now and when I watch that video it, it's amusing to me but I don't feel like it's anything that I connect with as someone who is very passionate about the place that they live. You don't connect, well first of all, you from British Columbia originally? Mm, yes. Okay, and you moved here 10 years ago? 10 years ago. And that image seems so foreign to you, it, it doesn't connect at all? I never had been to Ontario Place since I moved here. There was nothing that took me down there. There was no reason for me to go. When I think of a public space, I actually have a different opinion than you because my first job in Toronto was um, producing arts festivals down at Harborfront Centre. And that image actually makes me think of the times, the summers at Harborfront Centre when all of the people of Toronto come together and celebrate sort of the culture and the diversity. And I think that was maybe um, some of the sentiment that was trying to come across in that video. And so that's what, in, in my experience, is what I draw and what I think about when I watch something like that. I guess Harborfront predates you, doesn't it, Dave? Even Harborfront. The building of it. I mean, yeah. there's definitely memories I have of people coming together to celebrate things and to enjoy spaces, but those spaces were built. Like, what have we built in my lifetime on the, mm -hmm. on the Harborfront? A um, long string of condos yeah. and a few tiny parquets. Peter, those pictures, what'd you think? Well, I mean, I think it's worth remembering that it was built at a time of serious expo envy. We just looked to the centennial in Montreal. Ontario thought, well, we need some of that. And they had some prime waterfront land in which they could develop it. But I also think it's worth remembering exactly what Ontario Place was for. It was never intended to be a water park or even a concert venue. It was built as a permanent showcase to advancements on Ontario society, things about industry and science and 
uh, home life and culture. And just that way of thinking about Ontario society as a project that actually required some sort of permanent installation mm -hmm. to give us a kind of a window onto ourselves. Uh, I think that's probably even more dramatic than the geodesic domes and everything else that was ultimately built. So the notion, all of what he just mm. said, the notion of trying to do that today, 41 years later, do we just not do that anymore? I think we do it. I just don't think we do it or possibly need to do it on the grand scale that we did when we were still in the process of identity formation. I think here in Toronto of the CN Tower, which when it was built 1971-ish to 1975-ish, my lifetime basically, uh, I've always looked out at the CN Tower, um, we needed it then. We needed to have the tallest freestanding structure in the world as of 2009, the Guinness Book of World Records maintained a special separate category for the CN Tower, but in truth, other towers have surpassed it in height. Mm -hmm. And there was a certain amount of chagrin in Toronto when that happened. And my thought at the time was, well, the CN Tower's done its job. We can pass that city building, uh, world-class mantle to someone else who's still in the process of doing that. And maybe in a city that's filled with small, local, the city of neighborhoods that's filled with uh, local festivals of all sorts that are very successful. Maybe they have j that energy has simply been shifted, and maybe it's just not the time anymore, that era for grand public statements. Let me pick up on that with Dave. This notion of a city of neighborhoods as opposed to a singular public who could have been the inspiration for a major public project. Are we just too kind of cannibalized in our own little worlds now that that kind of thing just isn't going to happen or isn't possible? I think Toronto is both of those things, and I wasn't around 50, 60, 70 years ago, but my understanding is that Toronto's always been a city of neighborhoods, and I mean, immigration goes back quite a long way, various waves. So I think of reading In the Skin of a Lion and reading about when they built the, the bridge over, over, uh, over the Don Valley, the viaduct, and that kind of grand project. Toronto at that time was already a city of neighborhoods, and still then they understood that, you know, we need to build big things for us. So I'm not sure if that has to be a mutually exclusive like framing. Mm -hmm. We definitely want to be a city where we're building things for our neighbors, for our communities, but I think we could also get together and build for Toronto. Salima, let me get back to you for Ontario Place, because you were part of John Tory's panel, right, that took a look at Ontario Place, tasked by the Ontario government to, to find a new vision for making that thing work. And I wonder whether you see a difference between the public of yesteryear, for whom Ontario Place was a big deal and a big success story, and the one you guys had in mind when you did your work over this past year. Absolutely. I think when we were doing our work, we were very conscious of the fabric of Toronto and Ontario being so different than um, it was during the original um, thinking about Ontario Place. And we also were not just thinking about um, people in terms of their cultural heritage. Obviously, that was a huge, huge concern, but also in terms of just the aging demographic that you know, structures like they were built at Ontario Place, um, some of them are not accessible. You can't get there if you're in a wheelchair or um, if you're physically disabled. So our thinking um, about diversity was so broad. It was about age diversity, cultural diversity. It was about the visitors that come to our city and what would excite them to come back and, and really um, ha have this place of celebration, but also this place that belonged to the public so that the water's edge, you wouldn't have to pay to get down to the water's edge. Why, hmm. why is that the case? Why is it like that today? So. Hmm. It was a kind of a free thing once upon a time, wasn't it? It was like a big free public park that the whole public kind of embraced. Yeah. And as we were in that room and having those conversations with the many stakeholders and all of the people that brought these memories, and, and like I said, I had never really been there as, as an Ontarian. That's amazing um, that you're on this task force and you've never been there. <laughs> well, I mean, How'd you get on that task force? I had been there in terms of I had paid for concerts. I had gone to Ontario Place. I had gone to, I probably... Oh, you'd gone to the amphitheater. I had gone to the amphitheater. Well, I had gone to weddings in the pods. I had gone to the IMAX. But I had never, I don't have children, I had never gone to the water park or whatever it is that we think about. When people think about Ontario Place today, they have these, like, you know, I take my children and they have fun. And, you know, I don't have that type of association with Ontario Place. And so it was really actually, I think, valuable to have a perspective like mine on that table because there are people in my demographic, you know. There mm -hmm. are so many people who didn't grow up um, 
in Toronto and Ontario, we have, what, 100,000 people come to the city a year? Mm -hmm. And those people pay taxes and they're just as much Ontarians as anybody else. And I think that they need to be represented in, in um, you know, whatever the new vision of Ontario Place ends up being. You so. know, we had free concerts there when I was a kid. <laughs> I, I, know heard, that. I heard, heard many times over yeah. about At these. That's the, the biggest <laughs> loss in the entire history of Ontario Place, yeah. losing the farm. Yeah, we didn't have to pay uh, mm -hmm. big prices to go yeah. to the amphitheater. We had free, free concerts at the forum. And everyone had perfect seats because the stage would spin in circles. And, or you sat on the grass, which was also kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, think that's, I think that's part of this, this whole conversation, though, is that it seems as though government is usually pretty good at finding the initial money to build some kind of facility. Of course, the devil is always in finding the operating funds to keep it going. Uh, I'm pretty sure Ontario Place would continue to be drawing millions of people if the government had continued to invest in it as a contemporary showcase. But once it was built, once it was opened, and after a few years go by, the attention of any government happens to drift, new priorities come along, and unfortunately these kinds of cultural centers end up kind of being marginalized as time passes on. So is it just a quaint idea now? I don't think it's a quaint idea. I think it's certainly one that needs to be reinterpreted and reinvented. And to that end, I think the report that the task force put out is probably really constructive. Uh, some kind of mixed use, some kind of educational facility, reopening access to the waterfront, these are all good things. But uh, I think it's still significant that we're thinking less about Ontario Place as a sort of crucible for our sense of public imagination than a real estate play. A real estate play, yeah. meaning something to do with condos financing the rest of it or Absolutely. that kind of thing. Absolutely. Okay. Dave, get us started on this track. Uh, one of the biggest differences between today and when Ontario Place was built is that back then they balanced their budget every year. There were no f you know, financial crises the, way, the likes of which we're dealing with today. So is it possible today for the city of Toronto, the city of Ottawa, whatever, Hamilton, London, these major um, metropolitan areas in our province, or the province of Ontario, or frankly the government of Canada, everybody's got no money now. Can you dream big and think big when you don't have any money? No, but not having money is, 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 um, is a malleable thing. Um, the e economy obviously shifts. The economy isn't good now. We're also living in a time where a lot of people are buying into this idea that if government takes your money and spends it, it's a waste. And if the private sector takes your money and spends it, it's amazing. <laughs> so that doesn't make much sense. I think people are smarter than that. I think we can move beyond that. But we often talk about, you hear conservative politicians especially saying, let's run government like a business. And then they go on to mean that that means let's reduce our costs because businesses always want to keep costs down. Well, it just well, means let's not lose money. That's what it but means. But businesses also try and increase revenue. Mm -hmm. I don't see a lot of conservatives talking about that. And businesses also build things. They spend money on things. So there's a difference between responsible government and small government. And somehow a lot of folks have been able to successfully link those two. In the, in the public dialogue around what government should do. Everyone supports responsible government, but by attaching that to small government, then you kind of sway people into an area that I don't think most people actually believe in. So you, you can be a big government and be efficient. You can be a small government and be wasteful. They have nothing to sure. do with each other. I don't want the government wasting my money, but if they're gonna spend it well, consumers are more than happy to spend more, whether it's on a computer. I buy Apple computers. I could buy a PC for cheaper, but I think apples are better, so I spend more. Everyone does that. Consumer habits show that people understand that you get what you pay for. So how do we get us back to a place where people understand that government works the exact same way? You well, get what you pay for. It, you want to keep taxes down? Fine. You get what you pay for. It's a bit of a mindset, though, Peter, isn't it? We're, we're in a mindset today where everybody is, very, frankly, very concerned about whether they will have a job six months from now or whether... Uh, you know, our deficits are under control or whether we're passing a huge tax bill on to the next generation, your generation, quite frankly. Um, in which case, how do we dream big and consider these, you know, big once-in-a-generation public projects uh, if we don't have any money? It's, it's really tough, there's no question, because there are all these kind of macro factors that are making it more difficult, right? So we've got 30 years of income stagnation, we've got an aging workforce, and, you know, as, as Dave has pointed out, uh, we've actually ceded a lot of ground in terms of the tax points that we used to collect. So government is having to do a lot more with a lot less at exactly the time we hit that kind of 50-year point since the big build-out in the 60s and 70s where so much infrastructure 
uh, simply is, is outdated, right? And so what are the biggest troubles in this province, especially in the greater Toronto and Hamilton area? It's transit. Mm -hmm. um, we, we need more subways, we need more LRTs, we need more ways to get around from one side of the region to the other. But we don't want to pay for it. But we don't want to pay for it, mm -hmm. right? And in part, I think that's because there's been a race to the bottom amongst all of the political parties agreeing amongst themselves that they're going to, they're going to take revenue options off the table. And it's, it's hard not to have some sympathy for that because we also see the degree to which families really are uh, pressed these days. Everything is getting more expensive. So if the Salima, the big public dream project is no longer possible because of the bottom line nowadays, are we into an era where it's public-private making partnerships and hopefully something good comes out of it at the end of the day? Yeah, I think so. I do, I do believe that that is a really um, viable option for and the future. Works. I mean, you guys asked me how old I was earlier, so I think I can tell you that, I mean, from my years of what I, and the work that I've seen, I believe that it works. You know, will the factors change in the future, and, and will we have to consider other um, ways of doing things? I think, yes. Like, obviously, um, what we've learned from Ontario Place is that things change and that we have to be adaptable, and I think that's one of the big lessons that we have to take forward. But, you know, um, as I listen to this conversation, um, you know, there's this really kind of uh, polarized... Um, thing happening where we're saying public space is owned by the government and then there's no nothing else to talk about like I think th that all of us in our lives we gather a as communities as people in places that aren't necessarily these iconic projects and that they aren't necessarily owned by the government and I think that um, once we take our uh, sort of f uh, frame away from like yes or no and we do start going more into that middle ground of okay public private partnership or maybe all public or maybe all private then you know there's so many more solutions that that exist and that's I think a lot of the work that we try to do with the emerging leaders network is about that collaborative approach it's well, not let me, let me do a quick follow here you said projects like Ontario Place which are quote unquote owned by the government see I, my hunch is there's lots of people in the city who would say Ontario Place is owned by the people you know, the government, I guess, is the, technically the trustee, but, sure. it's, but it's owned by the people. Sure, I don't disagree with that. You don't disagree with Not that? Not at all. And okay. I think that's exactly why, you know, we need to think about these things differently. That the way that we, we talk about public space and consultation and all these things of, of, you know, historically how we've always done it is not necessarily how we should do it going forward. And I, I'm sure Peter has perspective on this, right. but going forward, you know, we, we live in this generation of the internet and Twitter and, um, you know, this access to the people like no other and why are we not using that? Dave. I wanted to jump, to jump in oh, actually okay. on something Selena had said and you mm -hmm. preempted that a little bit by talking saying mm -hmm. the public is about the people it's not about what's owned or sometimes regulated but certainly not owned by the government and we've been talking a lot about big is this past the time for big projects and what I think about all of these projects that were cr created around the same time, late 60s, early 70s, is it's like an urban forest. You plant all your trees at once, and then going on you know, a generation or two or three or four later, your urban forest all dies at once because nobody thought to keep planting new things, different sizes of different varieties. You have a monoculture all of the same age, and that's a problem. Is that what's happening now? I think that's a problem with a lot of our public infrastructure. It's not just the, the money nice problem, analogy. as you raised, mm -hmm. yeah. in terms of not providing the ongoing infrastructure funding to keep things from falling, falling apart, but do we need always to think about being what's, what's big, as, as Selena suggests? I spend a lot of time in High Park, which is uh, the west end of Toronto on the waterfront. It's it, not that it doesn't cost anything to operate, but it's a truly public space insofar as there are not barriers to getting there. Uh, Beautiful big urban park. Exactly. Right on the subway. It's, and it's a very passive kind of public space. And when we go there, we'll often talk to other families who are there. And where do they come from? Brampton, Mississauga, their families who will drive in for the price of gas, that's their only cost, to go spend time. And when I think about Ontario Place and I read the, the John Tory report, I think, how are you going to get a big anchor tenant, some kind of commercial, some kind of institution? I don't know that this is an era right now where we can attract those things. And part of me thinks, what if we were to just mothball it, put it into kind of cryonic 
um, suspension for a while until maybe there's an appetite or money or both to do something with it. And uh, part of me also thinks that I should take that urban forest analogy and turn the park into a true passive park. Maybe it would do more good or at least it wouldn't do more harm. Hmm. And uh, because I do a lot of my current teaching and research is on urban sustainability and the question about sustainable development, how do you uh, develop for the needs of the future or the present without compromising the needs of the future and the follow-up is we've already compromised the needs of the future maybe Ontario Place needs to be less rather than more big but mm. more or less passive park possibly it, the report talks over and over about um, environmental sustainability mm -hmm. good design so that's one way of access doing to it. the waterfront and <coughs> I think that is one way of doing it. Let me get Dave. So you, let me get some feedback from Dave on. I that. just wanted to say one more thing. Well, hang on. You've talked okay, for a long sure time thing. here, so hold on a second. Go well, ahead. <laughs> in terms of your comment about you know, the the public-private partnerships, I, I totally agree. There's a room for for everything. We should always be exploring all those kinds of options. But it's important to recognize that when a space is owned by the public mm -hmm. or the government versus when it's owned by some kind of private entity, it changes your rights as a user. So if I stand on the street or in a library or a school or any kind, or city hall, uh, I have a certain amount of freedom of expression, freedom of mobility. Uh, no one can tell me to leave because they don't like what I'm doing. And if you're in a mall or any place that feels public, if you're in the Eden Center, it feels like, oh, I'm on a main street. You're not. No, it's private property. It's privately owned, and they can kick you up for whatever reason they want. Mm -hmm. um, you can't hand out flyers. You can't put up mm -hmm. posters. Even Young Dundas Square is this strange arrangement that isn't purely public. You're not allowed to write on Dundas Square with chalk. Security will come out and ask you to stop. So it's important that just because something feels public doesn't mean it is. But one more quick thing. I really want to challenge this premise that governments don't have money and the private sector does. Therefore, we should go t to them. Because I think it's a myth. It doesn't make any sense because they both get their money from the same place, from us. But Companies have no money without us and governments have no money without us. And that's so, something I'd but, really like to take but, tackle. But, let me just give a concrete example. Toronto used to make its own garbage cans. When I grew up, we had garbage cans, and they were sturdy, they were strong, just like our mailboxes are. We funded them, we built them, they were beautiful. And about 10 years ago, we decided we can't afford garbage cans anymore. Government doesn't have any money. Let's find a company who will give us free garbage cans. We ended up with these pieces of crap made by a company that is an advertising company, giving us free garbage cans. Well, first of all, the garbage cans aren't up to the standards that we used to have. But number two, it's not free. It's paid for by the advertisers. The advertisers get their money from the companies who are advertising, and they get their money from us. So I used to give my five bucks to the government to build a garbage can. Now I give it to people at the cash register. So I'm still paying for the garbage can, but I'm getting a lower quality. Mr. Amy, follow up. I wanted up. to take up the, the issue of taxpayers, because Ontario Place, just to get back to the, the, the space here, is it's called Ontario Place, but it isn't about Ontario. It's about Toronto. And you might as well call it Toronto Place, although the name is kind of iconic in its way. And I think if Ontario Place is paid for by the taxpayers of Ontario, it's somewhat um, it's somewhat a side question about whether the government has money, in fact. It's whether taxpayers are willing, as a matter of public interest, to have that money put to such a use. And there's a perception, and that perception has reality when it comes to elections and votes. We're coming up to another provincial election. We're at a time of, of, of um, certainly represented austerity. What does that mean for a space like Ontario Place? And uh, I think of spaces in Toronto, because we're talking about Toronto really, mm -hmm. like Kensington Market, which is a true public space where you can put up posters, whether that's allowed in the city bylaw or not, yes. where a lot of the mm -hmm. businesses, they have stalls right out over the sidewalk in contravention of, of all kinds of variants of you know, re regulations. But that's a living public space that's allowed to be somewhat passive, somewhat organic. And I think Ontario's place, Toronto Place could work <laughs> better, maybe if some of that. I love the music uh, venues, okay. the wedding, let me go multicultural to, festivals. Let me go to Peter on this. We do have a couple of big things in the hopper potentially right now. Mm. There is the Ontario Place revitalization. There are the, this may not make a lot of sense to people outside Toronto, but there's an area of the city called the Lower Donlands, right. which they're looking at fixing up. Uh, Waterfront Toronto. I mean, some of the estimates I've heard on this thing are massive, thirty-four billion dollars worth of potential development in this. How much does that reflect what quote unquote the public wants, whatever that means today, in our quote unquote public spaces today? Right. Well, 
two questions there. One is about the significance, I guess, of the Donlands development. And it's huge. And it's important to note that what's priming so much of that development is actually the Pan America Games coming in 2015. That is not unlike Expo in Montreal or Expo in Vancouver, which it kick-started its own kind of uh, urban waterfront development, of course, uh, much less the role more recently of the Olympics in that city. So we see the importance of, I'm not even sure if it's fair to call them uh, public ventures. These are kind of civic enterprises, the Olympics, the, the expos, and the rest of it, uh, and the Pan America Games in this case. And I think they're really essential for driving urban form and, and ultimately creating some of these civic spaces we enjoy. Um, you know, why don't I leave it? Okay, so there, I mean, you want to yeah. pick, up, pick up on that discussion there? I mean, I, I agree. I think that there is this this place of like the civic um, life, and and through um, ventures like the Pan Am Games, um, you know, we have an opportunity, and I think that. Um, maybe this is this is what you're saying is this is a this is a moment in time where we're gonna go through this massive development and you know are we doing things right or are we making the same mistakes and and how do we how do we go forward as a public and and form that process? Well, I don't. You tell me if I'm reading between the lines here, Dave, but it, it feels to me like you're saying you're concerned that every potential big project going forward will have to have some kind of you know, Disneyland application for it, right? Either there's going to be some major private... Or a casino. Yeah, or a casino, right. I mean, whatever it is, it's going to be some... And where though... does the casino get all their revenue from? Us from again. all these people who <laughs> have money. I mean, we have money. I mean, yes, we're in a recession, but, I mean, we have money. If you look, if you put us on a spectrum of the planet, we are, we're, we're all the 1%, right? I mean, this is Canada, If you look folks. at it that way, I guess. So, um, yeah, if a casino can make millions or billions here, then we can also pool that money in other ways, intentionally, collectively, to build anything we want without a casino. Okay, so let's not look at 34 billion, which is massive, to right. redo you know, a, a piece of the city that has been sort of, you know, very much underdeveloped over the last many years. Let's take a look at smaller. What does smaller public and smaller public spaces look like, Peter? Start right. us off on that. Well, I, I mean, I think it's important to make this distinction somewhere between the market and the state and it is the civic realm. I think we're often conflating the two, that just because the government initiates the project doesn't mean that it is a government-run, government-owned space. Oftentimes, it falls to the government. As you said, how do we know the public even wants this thing, mm -hmm. right? I, I think that's actually a really interesting point because much like in the marketplace, it brings new products, new services, that may be focus grouped, but may just be the kind of inspiration of an entrepreneur thinking, this is a great idea. Mm -hmm. And until people actually hear about it for the very first time, this was Steve Jobs, you know, great secret to his success, never focus group an Apple product, come up with something insanely great, and people will support you. I'm pretty sure if in the late 60s you'd gone to the people of Ontario, that phantom public, mm -hmm. and said, so what do you think about a bunch of geodesic domes down on the waterfront that'll be this permanent showcase to our society? People wouldn't have had an idea what you were, what you were talking mm -hmm. about. And if they'd had to rate that against other priorities like transit or healthcare or education, it probably would have fallen somewhere down mm -hmm. the list. Uh, Salima, would you put the renovated Maple Leaf Gardens in that category of public, private, quasi-public, we have a university involved here, all coming together to create something special? I think that it, it is something special. Where what were the options on the table? It was all private. It was going to be a Loblaw supermarket. You know, there were structural issues with the the seats holding up the building, and so they couldn't go that route. So they found a middle ground. Now it's a place for students. It's a it's a full gymnasium. It's a ice rink. It's a grocery. You know, it's a building that has heritage. It has importance, and it was able to be maintained. Whereas, um, you know, if we would have left it maybe in the public realm, and like Peter says, it was probably low on the list of priorities. It would have sat there and, you know, continued to deteriorate. So to me, yeah, that's positive. I think it's an amazing development. And it's gorgeous, isn't it? It really is. They did a fabulous yeah. job. It's part of the lesson that blended spaces are always best. What does right? that mean? Blended spaces so that there's always going to be a mix of the market. There's going to be a mix of civil society and there's going to be a mix of government intervention. We know that from some of the federal government's great spaces. You mentioned Harborfront already. Granville Island. Uh, in Vancouver is another example. Really interesting mixed-use development yeah. that remains 
a kind of, it, it's almost incredible to believe that it is now more than 30 years old because it feels so fresh and, and vital. Mm -hmm. We know how to create these spaces and it's usually best when, the, when it's a collaboration and between different actors. There's a really great example in Toronto that we haven't talked about yet, but the distillery district. Oh, yeah. You know, a, a private developer who had a vision who, you know, we t when we talk about public and private, we kind of, you know, we talk about private as this like negative, nasty thing and these people who want to, yeah, they're driven by the bottom line, but that doesn't mean that they also can't be persuaded to come to the middle and to have civic purpose and they pub the private sector is made up of the same individuals, as Dave mentioned, that the public is made up of. It's, a, it's just us. And so, you know, if we can convince ourselves that this is something of importance, then I think we can start moving the conversation forward. But here's the thing. I don't know how much money they're making at the distillery district. They've taken an old, you know, rundown part of the city and really brought it back to life. Mm -hmm. Very similar, actually. We were in Kitchener-Waterloo the other mm -hmm. day in... in um, in the way that the tannery, which was the biggest tannery in, uh, in the, the Google, whole UK. Is that where Google is now? Yeah, yeah. it's a communitech hub now, and yeah. it's been complete, it's an old warehouse completely repurposed for, you know, for this incredible state-of-the-art means. I think they're making money there. I don't know what the distillery district's doing. I don't know if that's working as a, as a private model, if you know what I mean. And I, under, I understand, and I also am not privy to the numbers, but if we want to take the you know, Kitchener-Waterloo example, that's, that's a great example. Again, an old building that has been repurposed to bring people mm -hmm. there, and it has life now. Amy, does it matter to you whether the, the public through its government or the private sector through a private company leads this effort that we've been talking about here? I think as Selena points out, it's inevitably going to involve collaboration, not necessarily because people want it that way or even because it's good, but just because that's how things tend to work. Where does the money come from? One thing I've noticed in this conversation is something I encounter often in public space discussions is the idea that the taxpayer is silly, uh, controlled by their pocketbooks, uh, very conservative in the sense of not wanting change. But I think that, that it's, it's more important, it's, it's, it's variable interests are more important than we allow. So if it, it's not that we need to make room for private uh, partnerships as if you know, they are un demonized. I think often taxpayers are demonized as well for mm -hmm. being myopic and thoughtless and you know, Steve Jobs n knows what's best for Apple users so we buy a new iPhone or an iPad every time the new model comes out and is that really sustainable in, in, you know, in, in any sense? Do you Possibly know what's not, not sustainable? This show, we're out of time. <laughs> but thanks everybody for participating. I want to thank Peter McLeod, the principal for Mass LBP, led by people. That's what the LBP is for, very nice. Salima Raji, the co-chair of Civic Action's Emerging Leaders Network. Dave Meslin, the founder of the Toronto Public Space Committee. Amy Lavender Harris, the author of Imagining Toronto. Thanks very much, everybody. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.